syllabus requires you to know some of the analytical techniques that are used by a chemist. These are things that would be used uh, in the chemical industry for maybe assessing the purity of compounds. Forensic chemists would use these to identify um, chemicals found at a crime scene, like drugs maybe, or poisons or explosives or anything like that. What you have to do is not understand how the technique works so much, but how it's used to analyze compounds. The first of them is one that you will have met before, but probably not in this way. You will have definitely met mass spectrometry because it comes into units one and two. And when you did it before, you probably were given things like, here are the isotopes of an element, here are their relative abundances, here are the masses of the isotopes, work out the relative atomic mass, the average of them. And that just involves a bit of maths. That is not the kind of question they're going to ask you now. Instead, they're going to ask you to use mass spectrometry as an analytical tool. What that means is, using a mass, a mass spectrum would have this look about it. On this axis here would be relative abundance. That tells you how much of a particular substance is present. And along here is the mass to charge ratio. Now, since the charge is almost always a plus one, then that is the same as the mass of the ion. In a mass spectrometer, now again, I'm just telling you briefly how it works because if you understand how it works, then this does make more sense. In a mass spectrometer, you take your sample, you turn it into a gas if it's not already a gas, you ionize it, which means bombarding it with electrons so that electrons are knocked off. That creates positive ions. Those positive ions are then accelerated down a tube. They are bent by a magnet into a kind of curved path and then detected at the end. Now, when you bombard a molecule with electrons, there is a very good chance that you're going to hit the covalent bond electrons and break bonds. That causes something called fragmentation. And the fragments, the bits of the original molecule, which is called the parent molecule or the molecular ion, the bits that you then detect at the end can actually be put together like a bit of a jigsaw to work out what the molecule was. It usually means you have to do some pre-identification to know roughly what it was, but then you can decide between possibilities using mass spectrometry. Say for argument's sake, you were given the fact that this had been determined, C3H6O, that was determined to be the molecular formula of a particular substance. And you're gonna use mass spectrometry to decide if it's this, propanal, or this, propanone. Now, both of them would be three to hours of 36, and six is 42, and 16, they would both be 58. So they would both show a peak in the mass spectrum at 58. However, if bonds break, let's just break some bonds at random. Let's say for argument's sake, we broke the CH3 off there. That would make a 15 and that would make a 43. Now then, what if the same thing happened here? Well, again, that would be a 15 and that would be a 43. So that particular fragmentation wouldn't be much use to you. But what if the bond broke there instead? Let's break this bond instead. Okay, well, it doesn't matter here because it's symmetrical, so it's the same thing. This time I would get a 29 and another 29. That would be a big peak at 29 for propanal but there's no way you're gonna get a 29 with this one. If you break the bond there, it's 15 and 43. If you break the bond there, it's 15 and 43. In other words, the appearance of a 29 would tell you it's propanal. 
the non-appearance of 29 would tell you it's propanone. And that's basically the way mass spectrometry works. You will find that the fragmentation pattern of isomers will never ever be exactly the same. Now again, there are some worked examples. I'm sure you've got some yourself, and there are some in the revision book that uh, I produced if you want to practice these. But they're really, really easy. It's just a matter of doing a little bit of maths. Be careful when you're adding up. Carbon is 12, hydrogen is 1, oxygen is 16. Okay? And just be careful you don't add up wrongly. I've seen my students doing that many times. And then, of course, they say, well, this doesn't work, sir. It does. You've just got to add up properly. The next analytical technique that you will need to know about is infrared spectroscopy. The way this one works is, again, you don't have to know how it works, but it might make more sense if I just give you a little bit of background information. Uh, infrared radiation is not the most energetic radiation. It's less energetic than visible, as you know, and in no way could infrared radiation ever break a covalent bond. However, it can stretch that covalent bond. It can bend the covalent bond. It can twist the covalent bond. If you imagine the covalent bond like a spring, then the two atoms either side of it can do this. They can stretch, they can bend, they can twist. And those sort of energies coincide with infrared radiation. So when the molecule receives infrared, the bond may stretch a bit more or bend a bit more. And that will be detected in the infrared spectrometer. Uh, what the infrared spectrometer does is have a kind of 100% transmittance along the top and then if a particular bond will absorb that radiation then you see something like that okay now the table in the data book on page 14 will give you bonds together with the wave numbers as they call them it's like a frequency it's the inverse of the wavelength they will give you the wave number of a particular bond which in turn will allow you to work out the functional group which in turn can then help you to work out what the compound is. Regarding the, the sort of bond and why they absorb a different sort of energies, different frequencies, different wavelengths, different wave numbers, is all the same thing. If I have a covalent bond and the atoms that are in it form a very strong bond, imagine a spring, it's much tighter and that would therefore vibrate at a higher frequency. Also, if the atoms either end of that bond are small, again, they tend to vibrate at a higher frequency. Bigger atoms tend to sort of slow down that vibration. Small atoms will vibrate much faster. Again, you don't have to know anything about the sort of mechanics of this, if you like. You just have to be able to look at the question they give you, look at the peaks that, where they are, get your data book, find the table of infrared frequencies and match up the value. You'll see the values along here. They actually start at zero and go to 4,000. These are wave numbers. Don't worry about that. It's just a value. And these will give you the, the, the wave numbers in this data book here. Um, the, the first part of it is very complex. There's lots and lots of peaks and that's called the fingerprint region. You ignore that completely. We only need to worry about the peaks from about, say, I don't know, about 1500 up. They are the only ones you need to worry about. And there are certain molecules which stand out a mile. For example, if there's a big broad peak around about 3000, carboxylic acid. If there's a broad peak, not as broad, but a little bit further, about three and a half thousand, the OH of an alcohol. If there's a peak at about 1700, it's the C double bond O, aldehyde, ketone, carboxylic acid, um, ester. All of these are possibles. Again, on their own, you may find it's not easy to say if the molecule is this or that. But if you combine it with mass spectrometry and possibly a bit of other information as well, infrared can be very useful. In reality, what chemists do is they simply have a database. If you're a forensic chemist, and you are trying to identify a chemical found at a crime scene, you would simply take a sample of that chemical, pop it into the infrared spectrometer, get the infrared spectrum, 
and then put that into a computer database which will have tens of thousands of drugs, illegal drugs, poisons, explosives, all sorts of things that might be at a crime scene. And then the computer will simply find a match and tell you what the compound is. Same works for mass spectrometry. They also use computer databases. The next analytical technique is X-ray crystallography. This will be the shortest video of them all because, to be honest, I don't think you'll get a question at all. Um, the technique involves taking a source of X-rays, passing it through a sample. The sample must be crystalline, hence X-ray crystallography. The sample must be crystalline, and then what happens is the X-rays diffract. If you're a physicist, you know what that means. If you're not, don't worry about it. But the, it's the way they interact with the electron density within that crystal. That's going to produce an electron density map, which is then analyzed by a computer. And if you know the electron density, then you can predict where the nuclei are and then work out what the crystal looks like. The only question I've ever seen asked on X-ray crystallography was it gave the different stages, there, there's four altogether, and it jumbled them up and it said, put them in the right order. Questions on X-ray crystallography involve very, very complicated maths, much more complicated than the specialized maths that some of you may do. So trust me, don't worry about it. It's, it's purely a technique which is, is going to be a simple one to answer if, if they ask you anything at all. The last of the analytical techniques is chromatography. There will be another one which is very similar, which I'll mention obviously in a moment. But chromatography is one of the techniques that you need to be aware of. There are different types of chromatography. At its simplest is paper chromatography. You may have done this in junior school years where you simply take a piece of filter paper. They usually use it in kind of rectangles. Um, you put a spot of your sample close to one end of it. You then dip it into a solvent, being careful not to dip your sample in. And then as the solvent rises up the paper by capillary action, it separates your sample into whatever components are present. Thin layer chromatography works on the same basis, where they take a piece of glass and put a layer of, say, silica gel or aluminium oxide. That again acts like a capillary and solvent moves up. You can also get um, gas chromatography, high pressure liquid chromatography. They all work in similar ways. In gas chromatography, they will have maybe a long tube. They'll often curl it so it makes it longer and they'll pass gas through one end, an inert gas, which again will carry your substance along the, the tube is full of a resin and in all of these techniques the separation depends on the attraction for the mobile phase versus the attraction for the stationary phase, the resin, the piece of paper, the, the thin layer. So the bit that's moving is called the mobile phase. Now in thin layer chromatography or paper chromatography if you've got a mixture which contains both polar and non-polar components, and your solvent is a polar solvent, then it will carry the polar components further than the non-polar. Um, if you were to do this with a piece of paper, and you start there and your solvent is basically running up, this might separate into various uh, spots. If the solvent front gets as far as there, that's the solvent front. Then by measuring the distance your sample travels and dividing that by the distance the solvent travels will give you something called an RF value. That's called a retardation factor. And that will obviously always be less than one because the solvent will always move further. So if you work that out, as long as you know what solvent you're using, you can actually find data book values of RF values. So if you have, for example, a mixture of maybe dyes or amino acids or something like that, as long as you know the solvent that's being used, then you can match up the RF values and you can say what the samples were. 
Uh, generally speaking, as I say, it will depend on polarity. So if the solvent that's moving is, is polar, then this would be more polar than that. If it's in a resin and the gas is coming through, it often works with simply size of molecules. Small molecules tend to move faster than big molecules. It really is as simple as that. Similar to chromatography is the technique of electrophoresis. The difference being, we're not so much concerned now about um, mobile and stationary phases, although that does come into it. We're not concerned about polarity and stuff like that and how soluble something is and is it going to go more in the mobile or stay back in the stationary. This involves electro, meaning there's a charged plate. There's a positive side, there's a negative side. And whereas in chromatography we start at one end, this time we start in the middle, allowing our sample to go either way. In the data book, just to show you how this would work, glycine, which is amino ethanoic acid of course, has a pH at its isoelectric point of 6.1. Now the table in the data book gives you all of the names, all of the formulas and all of the isoelectric points. So they could ask you anything. But I'm using glycine because it's the simplest amino acid and one you're probably familiar with as my example. All right, okay. Now glycine has a pH at the isoelectric point of 6.1. What we have then in the electrophoresis setup is a solvent and that will have a pH. Now if the pH of the solvent was 6.1, the same as glycine, glycine would stay exactly where it is. In order to get glycine to move either this way or that way, we need to change the pH of the solvent in this plate, if you like. Let's say the pH is at 5. The pH of 5 means it's below glycine's isoelectric point. That means this solution is acidic to glycine. That will force glycine to act as a base and accept the proton. The proton, of course, will go there, so you will end up with NH3 plus CH2COOH. That means glycine will become positively charged, and therefore it will travel in the direction of the negative electrode. What if we change the pH to a value above glycine's isoelectric point? So now let's make the pH say neutral, 7. Now, glycine, with its lower pH, will be acidic and give up a proton to the solution. This time, you will lose the proton from there, creating a negative ion, which will now travel to the positive electrode. What if you had two amino acids? Well, again, if you look at their isoelectric points, if, obviously, the isoelectric point is lower, than the pH of the solution, then a negative ion will be created and it'll travel to the positive. But if the value is higher, and there's plenty in the book which are higher, then of course they will do exactly the opposite. They'll form a positive ion and travel to the negative electrode. So it's really, really quite simple. What if they had exactly the same charge and they both move in exactly the same direction? Now, how do you distinguish them and how, how will one move faster than, than another? Now it comes down to size. So if I have a smaller molecule or smaller ion, then it will travel faster towards that opposite electrode. 